This week, we're going to explore the question of whether our proof system, that is the proof system that we've developed so far, is cumulative. That is, can we take the results of earlier proofs uh, in, within our system and apply them to later proofs? And the answer to that question is yes. And in this lecture, I'm going to start talking about one of the ways in which we can do that. So let's begin by talking about the notion of a theorem. A theorem in our, in our system is a sentence of our system that can be proven without the use of any premises. So we've already encountered one example of a theorem in our system. We encountered that example when we introduced the rule of assumption. Recall that when we introduced the rule of assumption, we proved that the following sequence is valid. Turn style if p, then p. And we proved that this sequence was valid in spite of the fact that this sequence contains no premises. We did that as follows. We assumed p. Then we discharged that assumption via conditional proof to get if p, then p. And then we were done. Okay, so we see here that we can prove the sentence if p, then p, without making use of any premises. Because we can prove the sentence if p, then p, without making use of any premises, we regard that sentence as a theorem of our system. And this particular sentence, this particular theorem of our system, is a somewhat famous theorem of classical logic. And because it is famous, it has been given a name. The name that's been given to it is the law of identity. Another famous theorem of classical logic is the sentence, it is not the case that p and not p. This theorem is known as the law of non-contradiction. And we can also prove this sentence in our system without making use of any premises. So we can do it as follows. We can do it by way of a proof via reductio ad absurdum. So we begin by assuming something equivalent to the negation of what we want to prove. Namely, we'll assume p and not p. Since we're doing a proof by way of reductio ad absurdum, we now make it our goal to derive a contradiction from our assumption. But in this case, we don't have to work very hard at deriving a contradiction from our assumption because our assumption is itself a contradiction. So merely by having made our assumption, we have derived a contradiction from it. So really, all that's left for us to do is discharge our assumption by applying the rule of conditional proof, and then getting the negation of that assumption by applying the rule of reductio ad absurdum. And we're done. We've proven the law of non-contradiction. Yet another famous theorem in classical logic is the law of the excluded middle. It is the sentence p or not p. We can also prove this sentence in our system without making use of any premises. One way to do it is by way of reductio ad absurdum. Begin by assuming the negation of the law of excluded middle and try to derive a contradiction from that assumption. Now I am not going to go ahead and fill out this proof for you. I want you to try to complete this proof on your own. So I've given it to you as a homework assignment. But here's a hint. It is helpful to go ahead and assume p for purposes of reductio, that is, for purposes of proving not p by way of deriving a contradiction from p. And then once you've proven not p, you'll be in a position to prove the law of the excluded middle by way of deriving another contradiction and applying reductio ad absurdum. So that's a hint. That's a way for you to get started but I'll allow you to complete this proof on your own. Okay, so now that we've introduced the notion of a theorem, I want to note something that's a bit interesting about our proofs of these theorems. 
note that since we've proven if p then p, we could also, if we wanted, prove if q then q in exactly the same way. Our proof of if q then q would look exactly like our proof of if p then p, except for the fact that every occurrence of p in the original proof would be replaced by an occurrence of q. Similarly, we could prove the sentence if p and q then p and q in exactly the same way that we proved if p then p. Our proof of that sentence would look exactly like our proof of if p then p, except for the fact that every occurrence of p in the original proof would be replaced by an occurrence of p and q. So by having proven if p then p, we may, have, we may regard ourselves as having implicitly proven if q then q, and implicitly proven if p and q then p and q, and so on. Or as I'm now going to put it, we may regard ourselves as having implicitly proven every substitution instance of the sentence if p then p where a substitution instance of a sentence occurs whenever one takes a propositional variable in an original sentence and uniformly replaces that same variable with the same sentence throughout. So for example, take the sentence if p then p. If q then p, if q then q, sorry, if q then q is a substitution instance of if p then p, because we can get the sentence if q then q by taking every occurrence of p in the original sentence and replacing it with an occurrence of q. Likewise, the sentence if p and q then p and q is a substitution instance of the sentence if p then p, because we can get this sentence by taking every occurrence of p in the original sentence and replacing it by the sentence p and q. Likewise, this really complicated sentence that's even hard to read out loud, but let me give it a go. If, if p then q or r, then if p then q or r, that really complicated sentence is also a substitution instance of the very simple sentence if p then p, because I can get that really complicated sentence by taking every occurrence of p in the original sentence and replacing it by an occurrence of the sentence if p then q or r. Okay, now that we have the notion of a substitution instance of a sentence in mind, we can introduce what we're going to call the rule of substitution. The rule of substitution tells us that if a sentence of our system is a theorem, then so is every substitution instance of that sentence. So for example, since p or not p is a theorem of our system, so is q or not q. And for that matter, so is if p then q, or it is not the case that if p then q. And we know that, for example, q or not q is a theorem of our system, if we know that p or not p is a theorem of our system, because we know that if p or not p is a theorem of our system, then there's a proof of p or not p in our system. And if there's a proof of p or not p in our system, then we could also have a proof of q or not q in our system that occurs in exactly the same way that the proof of p or not p occurs, except that every instance of p in the proof of p or not p would be replaced by an instance of q. Okay, so now that we have the rule of substitution, we can introduce another rule into our system, which I will call the rule of theorem introduction. So here is the rule stated. One may at any time in a proof introduce a line that contains a theorem that has already been proven, or a substitution instance of that theorem. So in a moment, I'll look at how this rule is applied. But just by way of reminder, let me remind you of what the theorems that we have proven so far are. So, so far we've proven the law of identity, the law of non-contradiction, and the law of the excluded middle. You should go ahead and memorize these theorems and know them by name. 
Okay, let's look at an example of the rule of theorem introduction. So here is a sequent that we want to prove. P, therefore, P and Q, or P and not Q. Now, this takes a little bit of creativity, but one thing to note about what we're trying to prove is that our conclusion looks a lot like the law of the excluded middle. It's not the law of the excluded middle because it has P in there conjoined with each of the disjuncts, but it looks very much like the law of the excluded middle. It looks like something that follows from the law of the excluded middle on the assumption that P is true. So this does take a little bit of insight, a little bit of creativity, but one might think that one could prove our conclusion more easily by, go ahead, by going ahead and making use of the law of the excluded middle, or in this case, by making use of a substitution instance of the law of the excluded middle. So I'm going to, I go, I'm going to go ahead and try to begin doing the proof in that way. So on line two, I write down the law of the excluded middle, or rather, in this case, a substitution instance of the law of the excluded middle, namely Q or not Q. And I note to the right here that I'm justified in doing that by way of the rule of theorem introduction. So that's what the TI stands for. And then in parentheses, I have LEM, that stands for law of excluded middle. That's the name of the theorem that I'm introducing on this line of the proof. Now, I've been referring to the rule of theorem introduction as a new rule. In one way, it's not really a new rule. The reason for that is because we could, if we wanted to, prove Q or, we could introduce Q or not Q into our proof by proving it. We could just write down a proof of Q or not Q, and that would be a fair, that would make our proof fairly long, but we could do that, and then we could get Q or not Q on a line, and then we could proceed on with the rest of our proof. So really what the theorem, or what the rule of theorem introduction allows us to do is just skip all that by noting the fact that we've already proven Q or not Q as a theorem, and we don't need to go through all those steps again, we can just refer back to our previous proof. So in one way, the rule of theorem introduction is like a new rule. In another way, it's just a means of abbreviation. Okay, well this is how one gets started on this proof. Or what, this is a way to get started on this proof. Now, I'll go ahead and let you take it from here by finishing the rest of this proof. And a hint is that you can finish the rest of this proof by using the rule of OR elimination. Okay, so that completes our discussion of theorems and substitution. I'll go ahead and let you apply some of what we've learned on the homework assignment, and then I'll see you for the next lecture.